Can you start? Uh, yes, we are going to start. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are some instructions for the participants. Uh, all are requested to keep their mics on mute and uh, the video off as well, so as to maintain the decorum. And if you have any questions related to the topic, you can ask them in the chat box. They will be cleared by the speaker in the end of the session. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 10th lecture of Jyotir Vidya Parisamsa's public lecture series. Jyotir Vidya Parisamsa is also known as JVP, is a Pune-based organization of amateur astronomers and a non-profit organization. On 22nd August of 1944, some eminent citizens of Pune formed JVP, primarily to spread the knowledge of astronomy among the public and also to make their own contribution as far as possible. Right from its conception, JVP has been actively working for the propagation of astronomy in a purely scientific temperament. JVP is the first amateur association to host the All India Amateur Astronomers Meet in 1991 and the first All India Messier Marathon in 2012. At JVP, outreach programs like star parties are arranged every month starting from October to May. These are overnight stargazing sessions conducted by our enthusiastic member volunteers and are held on the outskirts of Pune city. On the occasion of special astronomical events like solar or lunar eclipse, three public programs are arranged in the city of Pune. Along with this, JVP conducts annual exhibitions on topics related to astronomy, a basic course on practical astronomy for the enthusiast and various study tools to observatories in India. JVP also conducts lectures in various, topic relate, uh, various topics related to astronomy. Our today's lecture is on introduction of archaeoastronomy and it will be given by Dr. Sagar Gokhale. Dr. Sagar has been a member of Jyotirvidya Parisamstha since 1997. He, ha he was working as a member of executive committee since 2002 and has been working as an honorary secretary of the association from 2012 till date. On professional front, Dr. Sagar is a chemical engineer with MTech in Bioprocess Technology and doctorate in Food Engineering and Technology from the Institute of Chemical Technology, or previously known as UDCT Mumbai. He has worked as a scientist in one of the leading food company for a few years and then became an entrepreneur. Currently, he runs a business named Ojman Food Bio, which is involved in food product manufacturing, especially health and wellness products. During his MTech and PhD research, he has published more than 12 research papers in peer-reviewed journals. Apart from astronomy, his interests are reading, trekking, and history of forts. In the field of astronomy, his inter interests are deep sky observation and astrophotography. As a member of Jyotirvidya Parisamsa, he has conducted as well as participated in various astronomy workshops and star parties all over India. He has also conducted research on variable stars at JVP and taken uh, observations of astronomical phenomena such as solar eclipses and asteroid occultation. So I now request Dr. Sagar to take over and begin his lecture. Thank you, Avandika, for the nice uh, introduction. And uh, let us start with uh, today's topic that is archaeoastronomy. Uh, please give me a few seconds to share my screen. Okay, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. Uh, so let's start with uh, today's topic that is archaeoastronomy and uh, so I will walk you through uh, di different aspects of uh, archaeoastronomy uh, which are related to India only or the sites related to India only and because this is a very vast topic and uh, uh, covering entire uh, all the sites across the world is uh, way too beyond uh, scope of this lecture so uh, I will just restrict myself uh, for uh, Indian uh, references only so let's start uh, so what is uh, archaeoastronomy basically and uh, as the name suggests itself uh, it is interdisciplinary uh, science of archaeology and astronomy so uh, we can call it as archaeoastronomy or astroarchaeology it's one and the same so 
uh, that's an interdisciplinary science and uh, it tells us how people in the past have understood the phenomena in the sky or the astronomical events and how they use these uh, astronomical events and, uh, in their day to day life and how and what role uh, the sky played in their culture so uh, there are uh, many astronomical events happening in the sky uh, and uh, there may be references of these astronomical events in literature uh, maybe in books or uh, the poems etc so that all uh, is part of our culture that comes under archaeoastronomy as well as uh, there can be structures like temples or you can see here uh, pyramids or stonehenge uh, there are many sites uh, which have some astronomical significance and uh, the, uh, about the pyramids i just wanted to say a thing uh, can you uh, drop your question in the chat box uh, no not a question just a uh, information these okay. three pyramids they are aligned to the sky with three stars right so this is a question or information information okay thank you uh, so uh, there are different structures uh, which are which have astronomical significance and uh, so study of astronomical significance related to these structures etc uh, all these uh, come under archaeoastronomy so uh, roots of this this branch goes back to 1678 when uh, john uh, abre or uh, in 1700 when henry Chaucy sought some astronomical principles underlying orientation of churches in Europe, or uh, in 1740 when uh, William Sturkley uh, interpreted astronomical connection of the Stone Age. So uh, from uh, 17th century, we can say uh, formal uh, or informal study rather uh, of archaeoastronomy started. So. Uh, the heritage sites, the archaeological sites, and their connection with astronomy started from there. And in 1981, International Astronomical Union or IAU, IAU sponsored a meeting in, in Oxford uh, on research from di different disciplines and their connections with astronomy. And one of the disciplines was archaeology. And from that point, formal study of archaeoastronomy started, we can say. <laughs> So uh, that's how astronomy and archaeology uh, started working together or started evolving uh, as a interdisciplinary branch of archaeoastronomy. And now we can see uh, that there are many research papers, books, etc., etc., on this topic. So uh, there are two methodologies uh, for the study of archaeoastronomy. Uh, one is green archaeoastronomy and one is brown archaeoastronomy. So green one is older and brown one came later one. So uh, green archaeoastronomy started with the book uh, by D.C. Hege. Uh, uh, the book name was Archaeoastronomy in the Old World. And the cover of that book was green. And that's why uh, this methodology uh, is called as green archaeoastronomy. There is no other reason. And since first one was the green archaeoastronomy, the another one is named as brown archaeoastronomy. So uh, the green archaeoastronomy uh, is related to the st uh, study of historical sites or heritage sites or uh, excavations and their astronomical relations, etc., or orientation of uh, churches, temples. Uh, all these come under green archaeoastronomy. So it is mainly related to the heritage sites. And brown archaeoastronomy is the study of understanding of astronomy in the history and what uh, astro what role astronomy played in the culture of uh, of the people and uh, uh, their calendars, their rituals, their festivals, etc. Uh, all this come under brown archaeoastronomy. So, uh, if we say the orientation of this temple is uh, like that, so that uh, the sunlight will fall uh, on the uh, statue inside the tem uh, temple on one particular day then that comes under green archaeoastronomy and when we say that makar sankranti uh, is celebrated on 14th january because uh, sun enters makar rashi on uh, that particular 
day. So that has some astronomical significance and uh, that will come under Brahman Arku astronomy because it is uh, related to festivals and rituals, etc. So uh, that these are the two methodologies uh, to study Arku astronomy. And I have few examples here. So uh, first uh, photograph is uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, the first photograph is uh, from Egypt, where uh, you can see a passage uh, uh, between the two buildings. And on one particular day, uh, sun will set exactly, or you can see sun setting through that passage exactly. So uh, this is related to orientation of uh, that construction or uh, the Khajuraho temple, uh, uh, the temples in Khajuraho complex, they are oriented such that on some particular day, uh, sunlight will fall on the deity. So uh, that is, uh, again, orientation of temple. So it is a green archaeostromy or stone age, we all know. And uh, whereas in brown archaeostromy, you can see uh, there are cave paintings which have some astronomical uh, relation like uh, they represent some figures uh, of constellations in the sky. So uh, that is a brown archaeostromy. So it is related to uh, some art or culture, etc. Or the panchang, which is a calendar, basically. So that uh, all these examples come under brown archaeostromy. So uh, these are some of the world famous archaeoastronomical sites. So when we say archaeoastronomy, then uh, many people uh, the first picture uh, come in uh, front of their eyes is maybe Stone Age or pyramids, uh, because these are the historical sites or uh, heritage sites which have uh, astronomical significance, and that's uh, why they prominently uh, come uh, in in front of you. Or Jantar Mantar, we all know it is a very famous uh, astronomical observatory in India. Or uh, there are Mayan culture uh, structures, etc. So these are some of the world famous uh, sites. And if you are interested uh, in more such sites, then uh, you can, you, you, or you should definitely read these two uh, books, which are published by IAU or Indian Astronomical Union, sorry, International Astronomical Union. The name of uh, the book is uh, Heritage Sites of Astronomy and Archaeoastronomy in the Context of the unesco world heritage convention so there are two volumes first one was published in 2010 second one was published in 2017 and they are freely available uh, i think on iau site so you can uh, go through these two uh, beautiful books to read about the various uh, heritage sites across the world okay, now let's uh, come to indian archaeoastronomy so uh, I have divided uh, the topics in uh, five main parts. So first one is astronomical references in uh, traditional literature and history. That means uh, there are astronomical references in Vedas or Mahabharata, etc. Uh, then there may be some references in history, like uh, some stone carvings or uh, stone inscriptions, copper plate inscriptions, etc. And uh, so this is the first section. Then second section is uh, the excursion sites and astronomy, like uh, Harappan sites uh, or uh, like Mohanjadaro, Harappa, uh, Dolavira, etc. So there are some astronomical uh, uh, significance related to those sites. So that's the second one. Then third one is temples and uh, astronomy related to that, like orientation of temples. Uh, the sun rays falling uh, inside the temple on some particular day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the third category. Fourth category is astronomical observatories, and the fifth one is uh, study of nakshatras, name stars, calendar system, etc. So uh, the Panchanga and uh, various astronomical books like Surya Siddhanta, uh, Pancha Siddhantika, Aryabhatta, Bhaskaracharya. So uh, all these books uh, can be uh club together for the last session so uh, my talk today is also uh divided into these sub parts but i will not be covering the last part like uh the surya siddhanta and panchanga etc because that's very huge topic in itself 
and that cannot be covered in just one hour the uh, a series of lectures will be needed for that so i will be just covering uh, first four topics today so astronomical references in history excursion sites temples and astronomical observatories so let's uh, start with some important astronomical concepts at the first because uh, there in, in the audience there may be uh, many people who are not really aware with a uh, few astronomical concepts so uh, the concepts which are required for today's lecture uh, let's go through these uh, concepts first so that uh, whatever terminologies i will be using uh, in following sections uh, you will be uh, it will be easy for you to understand okay uh, so this is sky dome so uh, just imagine that you are standing on a uh, on a ground and you are looking in the sky and uh, so on the right hand side picture you can see uh, a, a man standing on uh, in a ground and there is a horizon so horizon is a imaginary line where sky dome is so is appeared to be touched uh, to the ground so that's the horizon point exactly overhead is zenith then there are four cardinal points uh, north east south and west so how north is defined so you can see there a celestial north pole uh, just give me a second uh, okay. uh, so you can see here celestial north pole so celestial north right now uh, polaris is a star which is uh, or dhruva tara uh, is a star which is very close to the celestial north pole and that's a uh, uh, uttar dhruva we call it as or uh, um, celestial north pole now uh, draw a perpendicular line from celestial north pole up to the horizon and the point where it touches the horizon is a cardinal point north okay so th it is denoted by n here then 90 degree from the north is the east cardinal point 180 degree from the north is south cardinal point 270 degrees from the north is west cardinal point so these are the cardinal points then uh, this uh, line joining celestial north pole and celestial south pole uh, is axis of rotation uh, or earth's axis of rotation extended up to the sky dome uh, celestial south pole is below the horizon so we cannot see that uh, if you are in northern hemisphere or if you are in southern hemisphere that is uh, in australia or new zealand you can see south pole celestial south pole up in the sky and you cannot see celestial north pole or dhruvatara or polaris in the sky uh, now left hand side figure is uh, imagine that uh, you are standing outside in the space and there is a earth and uh, imaginary sky dome you are looking from the outside so whatever stars, constellation, planets, etc., we see in the sky, uh, just imagine that they are uh, attached to imaginary sky dome and it is rotating around the Earth. And we are seeing that sky dome from outside of that sky dome. So uh, if you imagine that, then that's exactly this left hand side figure is. Uh, so if we extend Earth's axis of rotation up to imaginary sky dome, it will touch into two points and that will be celestial north pole celestial south pole so uh, what we imagine basically is earth is stationary and this sky dome is uh, rotating around this axis at the speed of one rotation per day okay uh, let's go ahead now the second uh, second concept that we uh, must know is ecliptic so basically ecliptic is orbit of earth so orbit of earth around the sun uh, and uh, but we are on this earth and uh, we see actually sun moving in the sky so uh, daily if you go on plotting sun's position on the uh, sky map then you will get a imaginary line in the sky uh, on which sun will move every year uh, on the same line and that will be called as ecliptic so ecliptic is apparent path of the sun in the sky on the background stars so uh, if we divide this this apparent path of the sun in 12 equal parts we get zodiacal signs or rashi so uh, 
starting from Aries, uh, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, etc. Or Mesh, Vrushava, uh, Mithun, Karka, etc. So these are Rashis or uh, Zodiacal signs. So the, these are basically 12 parts of this ecliptic. So ecliptic is apparent path of the sun in the sky. So that's another concept we should know. Then the uh, third concept is uh, of inclined axis of earth and because of which uh, seasons happen. So here you can see sun is at the center and earth's axis of rotation is treated by 23 and half degrees and uh, keeping the direction same, it revolves around sun. So because of that, seasons happens on the earth. So, uh, so this is a summer solstice that means uh, the northmost point in the sky where sun will be uh, on this date uh, 21st june uh, so it's a maximum summer then sun will start traveling towards south then on 21st september there will be equal day and night and since it is equal day and night it is called as equinox day uh, on that day sun actually crosses celestial equator so what, what is celestial equator i will just come to that uh, in the next slide uh, then sun uh, still continues traveling towards south and on 21st december it will be maximum towards south and that that is called as winter solstice and then sun will start uh, traveling towards north so that that means uttarayan will start and uh, sun will travel towards north on 21st March, again, there will be equal day and night. So it, it is called as Northern Hemisphere up to the 21st June. Okay, so these four points are very much important. Equinox days, that is vernal equinox and autumnal equinox. On these days, we have equal day and night uh, and summer solstice and winter solstice so summer solstice is uh, 21st june that means the longest day in northern hemisphere winter solstice is 21st december that means shortest day and longest night uh, in northern hemisphere so sun is uh, at at the uh, uh, farthest point from the equator on this date towards south and on this date it is uh, towards north on the farthest uh, point from the equator okay so these four points are very much important uh, for us uh, again this is imaginary sky dome you can see uh, earth at the center earth's equator and axis of rotation now this is imaginary sky dome we are looking from the outside and now you can see here uh, the axis of rotation is extended up to imaginary sky dome it will cross at sorry uh, celestial North Pole and Celestial South Pole. Then uh, we have this ecliptic. So ecliptic we have already seen. It is an apparent path of the sun in the sky. So sun will travel on this large circle. Now Earth's equator is shown here. Now imagine that ex we extend this Earth's equator up to the sky dome. And then we'll what we'll get is celestial equator. So celestial equator is nothing but Earth's equator's projection on the sky dome so this is earth's uh, sorry this is celestial equator and this is ecliptic so these two uh, great yeah. circles will cross each other in uh, two points that is vernal equinox and autumnal equinox so uh, again let me take half a minute to explain uh, what is happening here so sun is traveling on this great circle uh, on 21st march it will be on vernal equinox so it is crossing the equator here and it is traveling towards north on 21st june it will be 23 and half degrees away from the equator it is a summer solstice that is sun is maximum towards north then it will start traveling towards south that means dakshinayan will start then on 20, uh, 21st september it will cross the equator that will be autumnal equinox equal day and night it will it will still uh, keep traveling towards south and on winter solstice it will be maximum towards south and uh, that is 21st of december so these four points are important for us 
Okay. Now, uh, the next important concept uh, which we should know is precession motion. So, Earth's axis of rotation is tilted by 23 and a half degrees, uh, we have seen. Now, this axis of rotation is not uh, steady. It is again uh, rotating. So, that motion is called as precession of equinox. And so, Earth is uh, basically moving like a spinning top. So, uh, in a childhood, you must have played a spinning top and how it rotates like this, you must have uh, seen. So, just imagine that Earth is also moving like that. What, what, what are the reasons behind that? Uh, I will not go into the details right now, but uh, this rotation uh, of precession of equinox, uh, it takes 26,000 years. So it's a huge number, 26,000 years. So in our day-to-day -day life or uh, daily life, we will not uh, experience this motion because it is very slow. Uh, but uh, because of this precessional motion, what happens is the pole star, what we are seeing today, it will not be a pole star maybe 2000 years after this, this point. So right now, Polaris or Dhruvatara is our pole star. After 1000 years or 2000 years, it will not be a pole star anymore. Some different star may be our pole star. So how this happens, I will show you in the next slide. And that's why it is very much important. If you have read about uh, uh, pyramids, then in the pyramids, there are paintings wherein Thuban is a star which is shown as a pole star. It is not a Polaris, which is our today's pole star. So uh, that's how pole star changes and that's how summer solstice, winter solstice points and equinox points also change. So in a short video here, I will show you uh, how this happens. Okay. Give me a second. Okay, uh, so you can see the video here, and uh, this is the Earth. Earth's axis of rotation is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. Uh, now, ecliptic plane is the orbit of Earth around the sun. So that's a plane which is called as ecliptic plane. And there is another plane which is equatorial plane. So Earth's equator is extended up to the sky. It is equatorial plane. Now, Earth is moving like this, like a spinning top. So uh, orbit of orbital plane remains the same but uh, equatorial plane will rotate like this when earth rotate like this so the period for this rotation is 26000 years and this is how earth will rotate in 26000 years and that's why the pole star and all these things will change so here you can see uh, the vernal equinox is okay So vernal equinox is getting shifted. So uh, right now we are we are in 2080. So right now uh, vernal equinox is uh, somewhere between Pisces and or uh, after Pisces and uh, Capricorn. So sorry, uh, Aquarius. So this is 2080. Then 4080 it will be in Capricorn. Then uh, it will be in Sagittarius in 6080, sorry, 8080. It will be in Scorpius in so 10,080 and so on. So this is how vernal equinox point will go on shifting. So vernal equinox is uh, the point where equal day and night happens. So right now uh, it happens. So uh, with respect to calendar, it, it, it will always happen. Sorry, it will go on shifting. Uh, so how it shifts uh, I, I will come to that in with some example so uh, right now equal day and night happens on uh, 23rd september and 23rd march it will shift the longest day today is 21st uh, january say uh, so it it will shift because of this motion and so on so that's why this precessional motion is very much important when we study archaeoastronomy because uh, what happened in the past we have to imagine and uh then we have to relate the phenomena with 
respect to precessional precessional motion and it will be very much clear to you uh, when we will have examples uh, in later slides now uh, look how pole star is changing with uh, with time so right now our pole star is polaris but few thousand years ago it it, it was not that uh, not the case so few thousand years ago there was a star named thuban uh, so approximately 3000 bc thuban was the pole star and right now we have a pole star uh, which is uh, name of the pole star is polaris so 2000 ad you can see polaris is our pole star and how pole star will go on changing you can see here so 2000 ad uh, is the present case then after 2000 years uh, 4000 ad and so on so after 12000 years from now that is 14000 ad uh, north celestial north pole will be very much close to the abhijit or uh, vega uh, star so abhijit will be our pole star after 12000 years from now or before uh, say 14000 years also it was our pole star okay so that's how pole star uh, goes on changing so okay so these were the few astronomical concepts which uh, one should know when uh, he or she want to study archaeoastronomy now let's go to a few of the cases uh, wherein we will see astronomical references in literature and history Uh, so astronomical references in vedas so uh, in vedas you can find list of 27 nakshatras uh, obviously uh, some of the names are different than uh, what we use today but uh, there is a list of 27 nakshatras then uh, there is a mention of uh, 12 solar years or lunisolar calendar system uh, then uh, so uh, how how uh, we can say that vedic period was these many years ago so for that astronomy comes uh, to help us so in vedas or the late vedic period nakshatra cycle used to start with krutika if you uh, know nakshatra cycle today what we uh, start with we start with ashwini so ashwini bharani krutika rohini and so on uh, we count like that actually it should not be starting with ashwini now because uh, the vernal equinox has shifted so vernal equinox is very much important so vernal equinox is the point when sun crosses the equator on and enters into the northern hemisphere so right now vernal equinox uh, or sun is at vernal equinox on 21st of march so on 21st of march sun crosses the equator and enters in the northern hemisphere and it is at vernal equinox and a uh, few thousand years ago uh, ashwini was the nakshatra there and that's why uh, nakshatra cycle we started with the ashwini right now it should be started with uh, uttara bhadrapada but uh, in late vedic period uh, it used to start with krutika or pleiades and that's why uh, so uh, it used to start with krutika that means the vernal equinox was in krutika and right now vernal equinox is somewhere in between purva bhadrapada and uttara bhadrapada so uh, taking these two references that right now it is in uh, uttara bhadrapada and in late vedic period it used to be in krutika we can calculate or uh, find the dating of the late vedic period so late vedic period was 2000 bc that means 4000 years ago Uh, was the late vedic period uh, similarly vedanga jyotish we can find by what was the uh, period of vedanga jyotish when it was written etc so there are mentions like winter solstice today winter solstice is uh, near uttara ashada so winter solstice was uh, at the beginning beginning of shravishtha or dhanishtha so it has shifted from shravishtha to uh, uttara ashada right now so and there is also mention of summer solstice which was in ashlesha right now i guess it is near uh, mrugashirsha so from ashlesha it has moved to mrugashirsha and 
so we know uh, that it takes 26000 years to complete 360 degrees and we can very well find out degrees between ashlesha and mrugashirsha and then uh, with simple mathematics we can calculate how many years uh, ago this happened so this happened in 1300 bc so uh, vedanga jyotish uh, was started or written the the copy which we have today was written in 1300 bc what we can say okay then uh, dating of mahabharat war is uh, one very famous and uh, important aspect where astronomy played a major role in defining uh, when mahabharat war happened uh, if it had happened uh, so there are numerous astronomical references in mahabharat and uh, typically people take two references to decide date of mahabharat war that is start of kali yuga at the end of end of the mahabharat and uh, two eclipses happened with the gap of 13 days so solar eclipse and lunar eclipse happened just 13 days apart so this these are the two references uh, that people take to decide the date of mahabharat war and then there are many astronomical references uh, in udyog parva bhishma parva etc so right now uh, more than 125 different dates has been proposed by different Uh, researchers uh, ranging between 6 to 6 uh, bc 6 century bc to first millennium bc etc so let's not go into uh, the details which one is correct and which one is wrong i am not going to talk on that but i am just uh, taking one case here so this case is uh, proposed by nilesh oak in his book uh, i have a reference of his book in later slides so he took few typical examples uh, or the uh, astronomical references in mahabharat so first one was fall of abhijit so we just now saw precessional motion and uh, i just mentioned that few thousand years ago abhijit was our pole star and after 12000 years also again it will be our pole star so that's a typical case that uh, during mahabharat war pole has shifted from uh, abhijit and it has traveled further then there are positions of mars during war so i, I think there are, there was a retrograde motion uh, during mahabharat war uh, retrograde motion or vakri hello motion of mars during the war and uh, hello sir uh, can you please hello, sorry uh, to interrupt you uh, your ppt is not visible can you share it again okay let me stop the sharing actually it, it was visible so. okay it let me is share visible it, it was visible yes it was yeah, so. okay i am sharing it again uh, sagar if you could also pin it to the screen so that it becomes visible on youtube yeah thanks uh, is it yeah. visible now yes okay yes Uh, then third typical case which uh, nilesh ok took is uh, the epoch of arundhati so vasishta and arundhati are the two uh, well known stars in the sky so you must have heard uh, saptarushi uh, in the sky a constellation saptarushi so i am showing it on the screen right now uh, so in saptarushi uh, the stars are named after seven rushis like kratu pula pulastya atri angira vasishta and marichi so this vasishtha star there is a another star very close to it which is named after arundhati so vasishtha and arundhati is a very famous pair so uh, famous pair in indian mythology also so brighter star is vasishtha which english name is mizar the fainter star is alcor or arundhati so uh, if you have seen the sky uh, you must have seen that saptarshi just rises like this only in the sky so vasishtha rises first and arundhati follows so vasishtha rises first and sets first and arundhati rises after uh, vasishtha and sets after vasishtha so uh, this is the case right now and in the mahabharat there is mention that uh, arundhati took over the vasishtha that means arundhati 
started rising first uh, before was sister so arundhati used to start uh, rise first then was sister used to rise and uh, while setting also arundhati used to set first and then uh, was sister used to set uh, so this is a very typical case and he run the software simulation to find out when did this happen so and he found out that uh, i guess uh, yes 11000 bc to 4500 bc this was the case that arundhati was ahead of vasishta so this is very typical case hit to and then uh, he narrowed the period of mahabharat war between 11000 bc to 4500 bc and between that he scanned again for uh, different uh, events like retrograde motion of mars and many things then and he came up with different dates so i have just uh, listed few of the uh, have, uh, events here that krishna left for upaplava and so on so uh, this is a case where astronomy helped in deciding date of mahabharat war so again there are many theories and many dates proposed by different researchers so and we'll not go into detail which one is correct and which one is not so but uh, i'm just trying to say that this is how astronomy will help in deciding the date then there is a, a mention of venus transit in upanishad so venus transit is that uh, venus is traveling on the uh, sun's disk that is venus transit that means uh, it's kind of eclipse uh, by venus so uh, there are two uh, mantras in upanishad in in the first one you can see that uh, there is mention of a sun spot a black spot on the sun visible by naked eye and in second one uh, there is a description so people at that point may not uh, had realized what is happening actually uh, it is a transit transit of venus and all and they have just described that it float uh, for it settled by the side of the sun and all so that is actually description of venus transit so uh, these are the so uh, most of the times i have given references from where i took this information so this information was taken uh, from the paper by ratnashri and shailaja madam then uh, there are many mentions uh, in the history so uh, this is rajatarangini uh, a, a famous book uh, written in kashmir so there is a record of comet halle in 1470 and 1531 so in this rajatarangini book uh, there is mention of halle's comet then uh, there are many papers by shailaja madam actually you can uh, search for uh, those papers they are available on the internet so she in one of the papers she has uh, given planetary records in stone inscriptions or in one of the papers she has given records of uh, uh, on copper inscription copper plate inscriptions and so on like the tamra part and all those things uh, so uh, pla few planetary positions are very auspicious on that day people donate uh, money or maybe uh, cow or land etc and uh, during the donation they uh, typically make a stone inscription or copper plate inscription tamra part uh, uh, all those things so uh in those inscriptions you can find the planetary records and uh with the software simulation now uh, you can very well predict when uh, that event actually happened and when uh, that stone inscription must have be have been made so this is how uh, astronomy will help in deciding date of that stone inscription or uh, copper plate inscription etc Uh, then uh, these are the records of eclipses solar or lunar eclipses uh, in different inscriptions uh, now let's go to next section we are running out of time uh, so uh, excavation sites and astronomy so there are many excavation sites related to harappan culture and we'll take examples of few so uh, why are harappan uh, people uh, needed astronomy so they might be uh, needed needing astronomy for uh, cal making calendars sir you are muted sorry uh, you are muted 
फार्मिंग एक्टिविटीज एक्सेट्रा देन वी ऑल नो दैट हरप्पन पीपल हैड ट्रेड रिलेशन विथ मिडल ईस्ट और ईस्टर्न यूरोप एक्सेट्रा सो फॉर नेविगेशन पर्पज ऑल्सो एस्ट्रोनॉमी इज वेरी मच इम्पॉर्टेंट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू ट्रैवल इन द नाइट पोल स्टार और द मोशन ऑफ द स्टार्स विल टेल यू द डिरेक्शन एक्सेट्रा सो नेविगेशन इज वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट एंड ऑब्वियसली एस्ट्रोलॉजिकल पर्पज telling fortunes and all those things and uh, so it is believed by a few researchers that nakshatra system uh, which is mentioned in vedas is actually uh, is ad- adopted uh, from harappan culture or harappan culture has a strong influence uh, on the vedas uh, related to nakshatra system and the lunisolar calendar system also might be adopted from the harappan culture or there is a strong influence uh, on what uh, calendar we right now follow uh, the panchanga and all so strong harappan influence on that panchang so it is uh, believed okay now uh, as we all know that harappan cities were very well organized and very well planned cities and the roads are straight exactly uh, crossing each other in 90 degree and all so these roads are uh, mostly built north south or east west or the major roads are built north south east west like that and uh, to know exact north south uh, road they must be aware about astronomy and pole star and all those things uh, otherwise it is not that possible okay so uh, so if they want to align their road uh, north south then they must have followed thuban at that time thuban was the pole star at that time and they must have uh, taken the reference of thuban star as a north pole star and planned their city accordingly now uh, because of precessional motion uh, north, celestial north pole keep on shifting so in a table here you can see that thuban was not exactly at uh, celestial north pole so it was towards west 3000 uh, in 3000 bc uh, in 2500 bc it was 1.8 degrees north eastward from exact north and in 2000 bc it was 4.8 degrees towards east from exact north so if they are just following thuban then their uh, if uh, Uh, the structures erected in different years must have drifted by a few angles and that exactly what people have observed in this uh, in different cities like mohenjodaro harappa dolavira so these cities were built in different years and uh, if they are following the thuban we can very well say which city was uh, built earlier which was built later because they are just following thuban and the Thub- position of thuban is shifting by few degrees and that's why their entire city shifted by few degrees because they are following thuban or uh, they are following rohini rohini was on vernal equinox at that point rohini nakshatra we all know uh, it is a bright red star uh, in the sky so if they are following rohini to build east to west road then position of rohini is getting shifted by degrees year by year uh obviously not every year but uh, we will recognize the motion but uh, in few hundred years or few thousand years uh, definitely there will be a major shift and that's why their city entirely is shifted by few degrees and that's how we can say mohenjodaro is the oldest city then harappa is next and so on so this is how astronomy help to decide the period of uh, the city is built during harappan culture now there is a calendar stone found in mohenjodaro you can see a stone here and there are few markings on this stone there is a uh, schematic picture uh, in here below 
okay let me take a highlighter okay uh, so two important markings or three rather one two and three so angle between uh, the lines joining these two points and these two points is approximately 47 degrees and uh, we know that earth's axis is rotated by 23 and half degrees so 23 and half sun travels 23 and half degrees towards north from the equator 23 and half degrees south from the equator so 23 and half plus 23 and half is 47 degrees so this angle matches exactly with that 47 degrees so that's why researchers predicted that this must be a calendar stone so just imagine that this stone is kept such that this yellow arrow is pointing towards exact east and this is uh, pointing towards summer solstice this is pointing towards winter solstice what does that mean if observer is observing from here if he places his eye here such that on 21st june today uh, he will sun, see sun in this direction then sun will start traveling towards south on 20 first uh, of march he will see sun in this direction and on 21st of december he will see sun in this direction again sun will start traveling towards north so again on 23rd first march he will see sun in this direction and again 21st june he will see sun in this direction so this is a calendar basically and there are different markings so wherever you are seeing sun today accordingly you can predict which month is going on so like so this is how this stone helped in deciding dates not ex maybe it may not have precision up to dates but definitely a uh, month yes okay so uh, this is a calendar stone uh, found in mohan jodaro and with the help of uh, precision uh, precision motion and how uh, 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 I could you show the uh, summer solstice and winter solstice? Yes, slide for a second. Okay. Okay, so uh, here the, these tables show how uh, seasons have shifted. Uh, so at present we have uh, summer. Uh, sorry. Uh, Vernal equinox or uh, equinox day uh, close to 20, 20th March. 5,000 years ago, it must be on 21st of December. 11,500 years ago, it must be 22nd of September. Likewise, we can predict how seasons have shifted. And the table below will show you right now. So present uh, at present, we have summer between April to June. 5,500 years ago, it, summer must be between December to February. 11,500 years ago, summer must be between October to September. Likewise, monsoon has also shifted from January to April to March to July. And right now we have July to October and so on. So this is how we can predict uh, how seasons must have shifted and how their calendars must be and how their lifestyle must be uh, with respect to seasons before uh, say 6000 years ago during the harappan culture so this is how uh, it will help to predict when there are few harappan seals uh, found in the excavation and uh, a seal here uh, in the top is having few figures so uh, these figures match with the sky map so here are seven figures which map uh, match with the saptarishi then here is a Leo or Siha, which is here. Uh, then I guess uh, uh, this must be Cancer here, and so on. So the figures in the sky are matching here with the uh, with this seal, and people just uh, say that this is a representation of a sky or, or uh, the constellations uh, in the seal. Or few people also believe that these. Uh, seven figures also represent Krutika. Krutika, we all know that uh, there are seven stars in Krutika. Uh, then there is one more seal here uh, found in Raymond Dairy. Uh, there are two sides of this seal. Uh, one side shows 
uh, rustic, uh, two figures of rustic, and another side shows two figures of Mruga. So uh, in Sky, uh, if you have seen constellations, uh, we all know that Orion or the Mruga and Vrushtik, that is Scorpio, they are exactly opposite to each other. So when Orion is rising, Vrushtik is setting or the vice versa. When Mruga uh, is setting, Vrushtik is rising. So they are just opposite to each other. And that's what maybe uh, people are trying to say here. They, they are just opposite to each other and that's why on one side they have Mruga and on one side they have Vrushti. So they had astronomical knowledge, What that's what we can predict. And then uh, there is one case uh, from Kashmir. Uh, so Burzaham is a place uh, 10 kilometer uh, northeast of the Srinagar and there are many uh, remnants found in Burzaham and uh, one stone is uh, of our interest. So this stone, if you observe, it is showing some figures with two suns. So there cannot be two suns in the sky. Uh, so there must be some explosion of a star, which we call supernova. So there must be some star exploded and supernova must have happened. And it must be visible during daytime also. So this is the prediction of course uh, but if we uh, predict see the figures below also so there is a hunter that is a orion mruga there is a uh, a bull kind of thing here uh, Rush, uh and there is again one more hunter here so it very well fits on the sky map so here is a orion here is a Rushab, and here is one more figure and if we just simulate uh, there is a sun here and there must be a supernova here. So then uh, with this simulation, uh, people just predicted that this must have happened uh, somewhere between 3000 BC uh, to 1500 BC. That means before 3500 years uh, before from present up to 5000 years from present. So somewhere in between uh, this uh, period of 500 years, or the uh, inscription must have made on this stone. Now let's. Okay, so it's close to eight actually, and I have maybe. Uh, some 15 20 slides to cover so i'll just run fast uh, so please bear with me uh, so now astronomical context uh, with the temples uh, so if we see the orientation of temples then uh, typically temples are either uh, they face east uh, most of the temples or uh, they face west in some cases and very few cases uh, they face either north or south so there is one a uh, study uh, related to temples and shrines in Vijayanagar uh, or the Hampi. So in Vijayanagar, there are many temples. If you have visited Vijayanagar, there are many temples. And uh, uh, this researcher, uh, I have given the reference here. So he just uh, studied orientation of all the temples and found that most of the temples you can see here, they are facing east. So azimuth is the angle from starting from the north. So zero degree azimuth is north, 90 degree azimuth is east, 180 degree azimuth is uh, south, 270 degree azimuth is west, and again 360 or zero is north. So you can see that most of the temples are facing east, uh, temples and uh, shrines. So they are facing east. And the orientation is also given here. So 90 degree exact is uh, east. So the, there is some uh, deviation from 90 degrees. Maybe that's a, a calculation error or precision error, or uh, people want to uh, orient like that only. And uh, why I, I will just come to that point uh, in few minutes. Okay, so this is orientation of temples and uh, to build a temple facing exact east, people must have knowledge of directions, not south, exact knowledge of directions, not approximate east. They have exact knowledge of 
directions and how they find out uh, direction so for that they had shanku yantra or a simple gnomon a vertical stick erected so this photograph is from ujjain observatory so there is a plane surface here and there is a vertical uh, pole uh, kind of thing which in astronomical language it is called as gnomon so just a vertical pole or, or a stick erected on a plane surface it is called as shanku yantra and you can see that a uh, shadow of the tip of this pole is traced throughout the day so so there are lines marked on this surface and this shadow will follow some or the other line every day so this will just keep on repeating year and year so and now you have a uh, motion of the sun and you know when sun will cross uh, the equator at that time sun will be exactly in the east rising in the east and exactly setting in the west then you have exact uh, east point and north point etc so this uh, simple instrument shanku yantra will uh, help in deciding directions and this uh, so what people must have uh, done in the past is they must have erected some pole find out the directions uh, in some uh, observation uh, with the help of observation of few days and afterwards that pole must have been used for some other reason and so this is my theory this is uh, not actually uh, written by any expert so just my prediction so uh, people must be erecting some pole and in uh, before building a temple and afterward that pole must be used uh, like a dwaja stamba uh, in dravida temples or garuda stamba or uh, any other uh, stamba so this is just uh, my prediction so uh, i don't know uh, how far this is true uh, i just need to confirm with uh, with the experts but uh, we often see such stambas in front of uh, temples so people must be using it to find out directions and then converting that pole into some kind of stamba uh, now let's take case of kiranotsav uh, in mahalakshmi temple kolapur so we all know that uh, twice a year they celebrate uh, kiranotsav in uh amavai temple at so here i have given dates so uh first set of dates is uh, starting with 31st january then 1st february 2nd february and second set of dates is uh 9th november 10th november 11th november so uh on these three days kiranotsav happens so sun rays uh, directly fall uh so uh at the first at the uh near to the uh foot of uh, mahalakshmi and then it rises because uh, the temple is facing west and that's why when sun is setting uh, sun rays so here you can see so when sun is setting first rays will uh, fall uh, near to the feet and then uh, entire statue of mahalakshmi will be lit by uh, sun rays so uh, i just tried to uh, play with google map so here i took the google map uh, uh satellite uh, picture from the google map of mahalakshmi temple and you can see here that this is the orientation of uh, of the temple and it is 19 degrees towards south from exact west point so this is the east west line and the temple is 19 degrees towards south and that's why on two particular dates when sun is uh tra first uh, in one sun is towards south in the west crossing this point sun rays will enter the temple and then on 21st of december it will be maximum towards south it will start uttarayan will start and again traveling uh, north uh, on its way on when sun will come at this point sun rays will again enter the temple so i took Uh, the case of first february here and you can see altitude and azimuth of sun here so azimuth as i just said so altitude is uh, how up sun is in the sky and you can see that okay sorry it has okay so uh, altitude is 4 degree that means it is just setting and azimuth you can see plus 250 degrees and few minutes so uh, 
270 degrees is exact west point so approximately 19 degrees towards south so this is how you can uh, just predict how, when uh, should kiran also happen uh, with the help of softwares okay. uh, then uh, there is one temple in karnataka at in shrungeri it is called as uh, so uh, so it, this temple is uh, vidya shankar temple and uh, it is said that inside this temple there are 12 pillars uh, they are called as rashi stamba and each stamba is uh, named after one rashi uh, mesh urushab and so on and people say that uh, on in one month uh, sunlight will fall on say mesh uh, rashi stamba in next month it will fall on urushab rashi stamba and so on but uh, if you see de detailed analysis of uh, these uh, 12 stumbers, then you can very well see that this stumber is actually uh, or either from this door or this door or the window. And uh, this stumber will block the light fall falling on this stumber, and this stumber will block the light falling on this stumber. So, this is not exactly true and uh, these two stumbers will not get light uh, in respect to months otherwise all other stumbers i guess uh, they get light uh, for a month uh, so each rashi is getting uh, so each rashi stamba is getting light for uh, one month and so on but not exactly true uh, these two uh, pillars will not get light uh, anytime Uh, then temple complex at Khajuraho, uh, that is important thing. So uh, temple complex in Khajuraho was built uh, during 9th up to 12th century and uh, it was it was built by Chandela kings and this uh, photograph is of Lakshman temple which was uh, which is one of the oldest temple in the complex and it was built by King Yasho Varman in uh, 10th century. So it was built between 9th 125 up to 950 and uh, as a symbol of uh, his victory or uh, the chandela king's victory over pratiharas he built this temple such that on the day of victory which was the holy uh, so on the day of holy the sun rays will enter the temple and fall uh, on the statue of lakshman so this is how this temple is built so just uh, to remember his victory every year uh, over Pratyaras on the day of Holi, uh, he built this temple such that uh, sun rays will fall on that particular day only on the statue of Lakshman. Then uh, in this temple complex, uh, I, I think except just one uh, temple, which is uh, uh, Chaturubhuj temple, all other temples are facing east, and this is a uh, map of uh, this temple complex and all other uh, temples are facing east and on some or the other day uh, this light keeps falling on the deity inside the temple so that's how this complex is uh, temple complex is built and there is one uh, cave temple in bengaluru it is gavi gangadeshwar cave temple and on 14th january that is day of sankranti uh, light exactly falls on the shiolinga here so it is a cave temple and here is a map. So these are the hills and there is very small gap kept here. And light rays exactly enter through this gap on 14th January. And uh, uh, they enter from this gap and then enter uh, through the door and enter through the horns of Nandi and then fall exactly on the Shioling. Uh, Shiva Pindi here on 14th of January. So that's how this cave temple is carved. Very uh, nice calculations. And on 14th January every year, uh, this, these sun rays pass all the obstacles and fall on the Shiva Linga here. And uh, then uh, you can see these two pillars, uh, peculiar pillars here. And uh, these pillars have a circular disk. and uh, they were built such that on a solstice day, shadow of this pillar will fall on this pillar. 
but right now because of the trees uh, shadow is not well casted and we cannot see this uh, phenomenon but uh, i think there is paper by shailaja madam and you can read that and she has shown how uh, the sh shadow of this pillar on uh, or this disc on this disc travels uh, through the year uh, then we have many sun temples uh, in india konark sun temple is very famous but uh, apart from this that these temples are of sun there is no other astronomical connection with these sun temples so either konark sun temple or modera sun temple there is no astronomical connection just that it is sun is an astronomical object that's why i will list it here but in konark sun temple uh, here is a uh, photograph of one wheel here and so we all know that it is a chariot of sun and there are 12 wheels and uh, i think two of the wheels uh, they play role of a solar clock here and a shadow of the central projection falls on uh, these uh, partitions or uh, of the wheel and uh, so here you can see uh, the timings also so uh, the shadow of this projection will fall here in the morning 6 am then uh, sorry like this 6 am 9 am am 12 pm 3 pm etc so this is how uh, this wheel plays a role of solar clock uh, then other sun temples in India, as I said, Morera sun temple, uh, then there is uh, one Shivalaya, which was originally a sun temple in Badami. Then Lonar, uh, we have Daitya Sudan Mandir, which is actually a sun temple, and a uh, cave temple in Badami. So uh, it is a simple cave, uh, and there is no statue inside that cave, but uh, there is just a plain wall, and every day when sun rises, so this picture is taken uh, from inside the cave and this is the east and sun rises uh, from uh, this cliff and uh, when sun rises, uh, sun rays enter the cave and fall on the opposite wall and there is uh, just one picture of sun uh, painted on the opposite wall. So that's a sunlight cave uh, at Badami. Then there are sun shrines uh, in Varanasi, uh, they are uh, allow so there are 12 sun shrines each one after one month so this is uh, again uh, i think towards uh, summer solstice it was and this is towards winter solstice and how sun travels from north to south uh, each month uh, uh, one sun shrine is assigned to uh, each month so this is it. sorry uh, this is in varanasi Okay, actually, uh, it's 12, 8 12, uh, and I still have one section remaining astronomical observatories. I will quickly uh, give overview of uh, two, three sites which are very uh, important, and you must not have heard. You must have heard about Jantar Mantar, and a lot of information is available uh, on the internet about Jantar Mantar. So I will not. I will rather skip the Jantar Mantar and I will just uh, cover two important sites. One is Dholavira. So Dholavira is Harappan city. And uh, so let me tell you one thing here. Uh, when we say observatory today, the picture comes in our mind that a dome with a telescope inside and a lot of instruments, maybe CCD cameras, maybe spectroscope and all those things. This is observatory. This is our today's picture. But uh, before invention of uh, telescopes, there were some instruments. And in old, old time, ancient time, there were some instruments. So at that time, motion of sun was very much important for them. And to track motion of sun, they have built some instruments. And we can very well call them as observatory. Because there are some instruments to track motion of some uh, celestial object. So uh, that's why uh, this observatory may not fit in your picture of observatory today. But yes, these are very well observatories because there are instruments uh, to track motion of sun. Uh, so this here are pictures of uh, some remnants in Dholavira. 
So Dholavira, uh, if you see the map, Dholavira is on Karkavrutta. That is 23.5 degrees north latitude. Okay. And uh, slope here of this land is exactly 23.5 degrees. So if you know construction of equatorial mount for the telescope, one axis uh that uh have angle of 18 and a half degrees which is equal to latitude of pune and so on so uh this place is on karkavrutta latitude is 23 and a half degrees and slope is exactly 23 and a half degrees this must not be a coincidence so they have purposefully made this slope as 23 and a half degrees so that person standing here and this is not south direction by the way so person standing here will see a uh, pole star touching the horizon. Exactly. Because uh, slope is adjusted such that. Then the second thing is uh, in Dholavira, all the constructions are either rectangular or square in shape. But there are two remnants which are circular or rather one is exact circle, another is not exact circle, but slightly off circle, we can say. So it is like this. So then uh, researchers uh, said that this is not the ordinary building and there must be some uh, purpose the work of Mayank Walpishan with respect to uh, Harappan culture sites and archaeoastronomy related to that. A, a lot of work actually. So you must visit TIFR website. Uh, and so these are the two papers by uh, Mayank Waiya sir and his student uh, Sri Kumar Menon. And they have simulated uh, the phenomenon here. So in next slide here. Uh, these are the simulation uh, run by uh, by them and they just imagine that there must be a, a roof with a hole in the roof such that uh, sun rays will fall or will pass through the uh, through this hole and fall inside the room which is not exactly circular uh, this is not exactly circular this is exact circle and uh, if we see a picture again there is a wall inside the structure up to the center of this uh, this circle so this wall uh, they have projected so here you can see this is kind of off circle and here is a wall and you can see that sunlight is falling here 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 on uh, so this uh, observatory is built at karkavrutta so when sun is at maximum north uh, it will directly come overhead and on 21st june today it was not 21st june uh, 5000 years before but uh, if this observatory is uh, operating right now then on 21st of june sunlight will fall exactly on this wall here you can see okay so this is how uh, he simulated uh, the position of sun and construction of this observatory and found that this must be uh, built to track motion of the sun and hence uh, to uh, prepare a calendar basically and predict the seasons okay. uh, then there are some uh, megaliths in south india uh, so this is in baise this is in hanam sagar so a lot of stones you can see here a lot of stones i think thousands of stones and they are aligned in some particular direction and here is an example. So on winter solstice, uh, 21st December exactly, sun is setting exactly in this line. So you can see sun is setting here. So if we join, uh, if we draw a line joining these two stones, that will be pointing towards uh, winter solstice day. So likewise, uh, these stones are arranged. And you can see the, uh, a stone here. It is very big stone, actually uh and many stones uh, are spread in this area and uh, that's why i call uh, 
this as a, as some kind of instrument to predict or to find out uh, position of sun or track position of sun and that's why i have, I have categorized it uh, in observatories so this is some kind of instrument to track the motion of the sun uh, so these uh, stones must be erected during iron age uh, that means uh, 1200 bc to 500 bc and practice must be originated from neolithic period that means 3000 bc to 1200 bc and so on and it continued till 500 ad actually okay. uh, so this is again uh, work by mayank Waya and his group then uh, a last site i will cover is udaygiri observatory and uh, this is in vidisha uh, madhya pradesh and this iron pillar in the in delhi was actually uh, placed here in udaygiri it was in a corridor uh, so this observatory uh, was built in second century bc that means uh, 200 years before christ so uh, second century bc it, it was built uh, in the period of gupta emperor uh, chandragupta second and vikramaditya built this observatory and uh, the iron pillar uh, just now i said it was uh, located at the entrance of the passageway so on the summer solstice day uh, the alignment was such that uh, sun's motion can be seen uh, through the passageway so, uh, so this is oriented in such a way that on summer solstice day uh, you can see sun rising and setting from the passageway uh then there are two sites uh here you can see the layout of the observatory and you can see solar observatory here and solar observatory here so two sites basically which uh, we predict that there must be a solar observatory and why so uh in this slide i have shown some remnants uh, here so these are the remnants of a pillar and uh, here again i am showing a shanku yantra in ujjain so there must be a shanku yantra built with these pillars and that's why i call it as solar observatory and uh, these are the remnants broken remnants actually and there are two platforms so this platform uh, edge of this platform directs towards winter solstice then uh, here is also one platform uh, with some remnants of uh, some shanku yantra so that's how uh, there were two solar observation sites uh, located in Udayiri Observatory. So uh, next is Jantar Mantar, and as I said, I will just skip this because it's already 8.20 and we should stop now. A lot of information is available uh, about Jantar Mantar and on internet. So uh, these observatories were built by, either built by Maharaja Jaising or he has revived a few old observatories like uh, Manamandir Vedala in Varanasi, he just revived the old observatory and rebuilt, rebuilt it and added few instruments there. So these are the list of instruments uh, in each of the observatory. Few of the instruments are uh, from Hindu tradition, few are from the Islamic tradition. Uh, so these were the five, sorry, these were the five Jantar Mantar observatories built or revived by Maharaja Jaising and these are few instruments uh, you can uh, just go through them uh, afterwards and these are some in important instruments like jay prakash yantra samrat yantra then uh, nadi Ola yantra chakra yantra ram yantra and so on okay so that's it for today and uh, i have just listed topics which i did not cover in this lecture because they are too vast and much uh, details need to be covered like Vedanga Jyotish and Panchang, then books like Surya Siddhanta, Pancha Siddhantika, etc. Then mythological stories about constellations, stars, etc. So these were not covered today. And here are a few of the references which uh, you can refer to. Uh, as I already said, UNESCO, uh, World Heritage Convention, and IAU have published two books available on the internet. Then you should see work by Mayank Waiya and his group. So this is the website of TIFR, and you should see that. And obviously, I 
think I have forgot to mention yes, Shailaja Madam's uh, papers here, but there are many papers by Shailaja Madam, and uh, I, I think I have not listed one more researcher uh, is uh, Dr. Kark. Uh, I just forgot to mention his name here. A lot of work done by many researchers. Just a take home message is uh, people are knowing about astronomical facts for many, many hundreds of years or thousands of years. And they used to uh, use these concepts for various reasons, maybe for seasons, for traveling, navigation, for uh, calendrical purpose, etc. And we should study that. Then we have astronomical references through many books, literatures, pages for the length kept in uh, some lab in say France or UK, etc. So likewise, uh, in ancient times, standard were used to be kept in temples standard waves so how so at that time uh was not that easy so standard weights standard lengths the references for that used to be kept in temples and temple people used to help people to uh measure such things like measuring the land the how much acre is the land so you must have some standard lengths uh standard measure for that so temples used to keep uh, all the records. So just my last message is, so when you travel and uh, go visit any heritage site, just look for some astronomical relevance there. You must, you will find some astronomical relevance and you must study that. So that's the final message. Uh, so thank you for today. That's my email ID. You can write to me if you have any doubts and already approaching. 830 uh, maybe yes, yes, sir. it was uh, just to uh, it was an awesome lecture uh, yeah uh, it was very fascinating to know how harappan civilization knew such astronomical phenomena and how they built such a great architecture so we will take some questions uh, first one is yep. from advitiya sir why the ancient astronomy after being so accurate yet it is so underrated it is too underrated yes why it is uh, so actually yeah so uh, there are two uh, actually streams so some people say that the, everything is written in vedas or we knew everything and uh, rather more than what nasa did we uh, not even know what is exactly written in Vedas uh, with respect to astronomy and we sh there is a lot of scope to study that and yes there was a very big tradition in Indian uh, culture very big astronomical uh, tradition and uh, somehow we have lost the touch that's the truth and uh, right so Panchanga if you see uh, very accurate calculations or rather we also uh, new distances between say earth and venus etc but somehow uh, all that tradition is lost and now we depend more uh, on the west for the calculations so that's unfortunate yeah uh, and why they build cities according to stars or nakshatra uh the harappan cities uh yeah, they, so they are very well organized, and uh, so if they want to uh, build a road uh, north south exactly, how will you find north south? Which direction is north and which is south? So you have to rely on stars uh, to find out exact north and south, and that's why uh, they started observing stars, and then uh, they must have found that uh, there is one pole star which is exactly towards north, and they just keep following that pole star which was Thuban at that time and then built their cities accordingly yeah. were calendar stones found in every house uh not sure i have just read about a uh, calendar stone in mohanjadaro i am not sure about other cities like harappa or dola etc i don't think so yeah and this slide uh, in the slide uh, there was a picture of a supernova kind of thing so can you tell us more about yeah. what supernova was it and yeah so uh, 
if you know the life cycle of uh, a star uh, so sun is a normal star uh, that means hydrogen is getting converted to helium and so on so when hydrogen will uh, be consumed entirely uh, the forces will be imbalanced and then it will explode so if star is smaller like a sun sun is not a very big star it is just average star uh, the explosion will not be very huge but if there are very big stars then they will just explode and uh, the explosion will be very big and uh, so explosion will be very big and the star will become so bright that even uh, some of the times you can see it uh, during daytime also and then that is called as supernova so normal explosion is called as nova if it is very big star and very big explosion it is called as supernova so that's what uh, it was represented there uh, in that stone carving uh, one must be sun and another must be supernova which is visible during daytime otherwise during daytime we cannot see any star because of the sun yeah but, but uh, uh, can... which supernova was it of a was it of a specific star or something Yes, like uh, what? it was some specific star. Obviously, we don't know which star uh, right now because we don't know exact uh, period, and that's why we don't know uh, which star because that star is no more uh, present there. It just exploded. Okay. Okay. Uh, another one. We saw in your presentation that there are temples where some sun rays fall on some deity, pole, etc., on specific days of a year. Uh, but why? Yeah. Why is it created that way? uh maybe for calendrical purpose uh, just to know that every year uh, when is the equinox day is happening so if uh, on some particular day because there uh, in ancient time uh, there was no printed calendars as such so people uh, didn't had uh, calendars at their home so temple was uh, the center where they will get to know uh, which month is going on or uh, the panchang and all so just to uh, maybe uh, to follow, follow the uh, motion of the sun they must have uh, built temples such that they are facing east or west like that i i, I don't know any other particular reason for that uh, since i am not aware i am not expert in that uh, avandika you are on mute Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, is there an architecture based on the motion of moon? Uh, I'm not very much aware about it. Uh, just one uh, thing I have read about um, um, the temple in Kolhapur district, uh, Khidrapur, Khidrapur temple in. Uh, Kolhapur district, wherein on uh, one particular full moon or Purnima, uh, you can see uh, mm -hmm. moon from one particular, uh, I think, hole in the uh, cylindrical, yeah, structure. cylindrical structure. So that's the only uh, mention I can remember right now. Uh, yeah, in Kidrapur. Yeah, Popeshwar temple in Kidrapur. Yeah, and there is another one related to the uh, carving, stone carving about the supernova. Can it be a moon, one moon and the second one is the sun? Maybe. As, the, yeah. as if yeah. the pictures below are correlated to the constellations, these will not be visible if it was a sun. Uh, yes, obviously it will not be visible, but uh, we had knowledge of uh, Rashis and Nakshatras and uh, how sun travels from one Rashi to another Rashi or one Nakshatra to another that knowledge we had from thousands of years and so we know uh, in panchang uh, if you have seen a panchang we very well know sun is in which nakshatra so that's not a problem and if you see the locations uh, of two stars uh, in that carving if that is a moon another one is a moon if that moon is if it is very close to the sun we cannot see that moon because it will be very small so if you have uh, tried seeing uh, pratipada moon or dvitiya moon uh, it is very difficult to locate even after sunset and uh, during daytime moon is visible uh, that is right but not 
when it is very close to sun so that's why that theory is discarded earlier people used to say that uh, it might be sun and moon but that theory was later discarded because if moon is so close it will not be visible during day time so that's why people said that uh, it must be a supernova yeah and the last one so can we say harappan civilization knew that earth is round and heliocentric model uh not sure about heliocentric model uh, but uh, yes earth was uh, round people knew about that because uh, when people uh, travel they uh, they can see uh, that uh, the pole star is not at the same location from each side so if uh, people travel towards south they see pole star going down or people if they travel towards north they see uh, pole star rising up and that's why they predicted that earth must not be a flat and it must be a round and also uh, different positions of sun also uh, from different locations from that people had predicted that earth was uh, earth is not flat and it is round so it was uh, the belief so people knew from india to middle east to greece everywhere everywhere people knew that uh, earth is round and it is not flat okay so i think uh, all questions are answered so thank you once again for uh, such a wonderful lecture thank you uh, have a good night yes good night